We'll turn now again in your copy of God's Word to the book of 1 Samuel. No surprises there. 1 Samuel, you can find chapter 2 on pages 212 or 267. Again, that's 1 Samuel chapter 2. We were in 1 Samuel chapter 2. Last time we were looking at Hannah's song, and it was a glorious song, wasn't it? It was, it was beautiful. God, there's no rock like our God. Well, this morning we, we have a, um, a more difficult passage ahead of us. It also happens to be a longer passage. <laughs> but here's a, here's a little uh, game for you while we're reading. Not that we should be playing games we're reading God's word, but just if you're having trouble paying attention, just try to keep track of how many times Samuel is mentioned in this passage. Just keep, keep that number in your head, write it down somewhere, and if you tell me uh, at the door there, I don't have any prizes, but I'll, I'll say, well, good job. <laughs> Kids, next week I might have candy for you if, if you, if you get it. I'll be very impressed. But anyway, this is this is God's holy word, and we're to give attention to it. This is 1 Samuel chapter 2, starting in verse 12, going to the end of the chapter. Give attention now to the reading of God's word. Actually, I'll begin in verse 11. Then Elkanah went home to Ramah, and the boy was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli the priest. Now, the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. The custom of the priests with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand, and he would thrust it into the pan or the kettle or the cauldron or the pot. All that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is what they did at Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Moreover, before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give me meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. And if the man said to him, well, let them burn the fat first and then take as much as you wish, he would say, no, you must give it now, and if not, I will take it by force. Thus, the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord. For the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy clothed with a linen ephod. And his mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord give you children by this woman for the petition she asked of the Lord. So then she would return, they would return to their home. And indeed, the Lord visited Hannah and she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. And the boy Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. Now, Eli was very old, and he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all Israel, and how they, they even lay with the women who were serving at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And he said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all these people. No, my sons, it is no good report that I hear the people of the Lord spreading abroad. If someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father. For it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow, both in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. And there came a man of God to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Did I indeed reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt subject to the house of Pharaoh? Did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to go up to my altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? I gave to the house of your father all my offerings by fire from the people of Israel. Why then do you scorn my sacrifices and my offerings that I commanded for my dwelling and honor your sons above me by fattening yourselves on the choicest parts of every offering of my people Israel? Therefore, the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promise that your house and the house of your father should go in and out before me forever, but now the Lord declares, far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor. 
and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming when I will cut off your strength and the strength of your father's house so that there will not be an old man in your house. Then in distress you will look with envious eye on the prosperity, all the prosperity that shall be bestowed on Israel and there shall not be an old man in your house forever. The only one of you, of you whom I shall not cut off from my altar shall be spared to weep his eyes out, to grieve his heart. And all the descendants of your house shall die by the sword of men. And this that shall come upon your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, shall be the sign to you, both of them shall die on the same day. And I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind, and I will build him a sure house, and he shall go in and out before my anointed forever. And everyone who is left in your house shall come to implore him for a piece of silver or a loaf of bread, and shall say, Please, put me in one of the priest's places, that I may eat a morsel of bread." The word of the Lord. I'd like to talk to you this morning about a championship game. Don't worry, it's not the one that you think. No. This event took place a long time ago, in July of 1924. It was the Paris Summer Olympics. Perhaps you know the story. Months before, Eric Little, a Scottish runner, was set to win the 100-meter race. Everyone was looking with expectation. All Britain was cheering behind him. There was only one problem for Eric. When the schedule came out, Little discovered that in order to run the 100-meter, he'd have to compete on a Sunday. Eric Little was a Christian. He knew the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day, and keep it holy. Six days shall ye labor and do all your work, but on the seventh, that's the Sabbath of the Lord your God, you shall not do any work on it. In Little's mind, he could not in good faith keep the Sabbath while also competing on it. And so he withdrew from the race. It was not a popular decision. A gold medal would mean glory and honor for Britain, especially at a time when international relations were, you could say, at a tense moment. Britain was looking for glory, so you can imagine the British people were not very happy to see this gold medal slipping away over what they considered a mere triviality. In fact, rather than competing on his best event on Sunday in the 100 meter, Little would go on to compete in the 400 meter race. Far more difficult, he had a few months only to train but in fact, it was on July 11th of 1924, in the 400 meter final, that Eric Little won, setting an Olympic record for 47.6 seconds, I think, which would stand for the next 12 years. You see, this is a remarkable story. We think it's a remarkable story because we made a movie about it, Chariots of Fire, if you've heard it. Watch it for, I haven't seen it, but I love the soundtrack, so I, I want to see it one of these days. But, but one of the most remarkable parts about the story for me, and I'm not sure if this is in the movie. If you've seen it, you can tell me after the service. But, but one of the most remarkable parts of this story is something that happened on the very morning of the race. A seemingly small exchange. That morning, Eric was handed a note from one of his team members, and he didn't have time to read it, so he said, okay, I'll, I'll check it later. And later on, he did read the note, and it had these words. He that honors me, I will honor. First Samuel 2, verse 30. There's not a lot of honor in our passage this morning. And sadly, the situation is not always that different today among the spiritual leaders in the church. Now, we need to be careful here. I need to be careful here. Because it's easy to get caught up in the headlines and the news feeds and the podcast and start to think, well, I guess when I look out in the world and I see so many things going wrong in the church, I guess the church is just a bunch of bad news and Christians are a bunch of hate-filled hypocrites. But there's so much good happening in the church. Let's affirm that. Can we affirm that? There is so much good happening in the church today. 
Yes, including evangelical churches, right? Of which we are one. As a recent opinion piece in World Magazine states, we can tackle problems somewhere without assuming that there are problems everywhere or the same problem everywhere. So we need to be careful, but putting that there, being careful, the problems do still exist. There is dishonor in Christ's church. And I'm willing to bet that most of you, if not all of you, know firsthand the damage that is caused when the church's spiritual leaders fail to honor the Lord. Thank God that that's not all that he has to say to us this morning in our passage. But it is where we have to begin. Our passage begins with a story of what happens when priests fail to be spiritual leaders in the household of God. To understand what's going on, to, to, to appreciate it, you, you don't need to know all the background of what the priests were doing to understand that something really bad is going on here, but it is important to understand just what it was that the priests were called to do. The priests were called to serve as mediators between God and man. In fact, God actually gives, I mean, you can read through the book of Leviticus. You can actually read earlier. We, we first meet a priest uh, named Melchizedek back in the days of Abraham. But putting him aside, we, we have the Levitical priesthood established in the days of Moses. And you can read about all the sacrifices and all, everything that was involved in the priesthood. But God gives actually a summary of it here. When you get a job review, right? Usually it goes over, what, were your, what, were, what was your job description? Well, here's the priest's job description. God says, I chose your father. He's referring to Levi, the tribe of Levi. I chose your father and his house out of all the tribes to be my priest. And what did he say? He says, I gave you to go up to my altar to burn incense and to wear the ephod before me. To go up to the altar. The priests were the ones who were to go up and make the sacrifices on behalf of the people. The people would come and bring their sacrifices. Some were sacrifices of thanksgiving. Some were sacrifices of praise. Others were sacrifices of atonement. In any case, in every case, the priest was to bring sacrifices to the altar. To cover the altar in blood. To purify it. To burn. To boil. To do all of these different ritual sacrifices. To point us to the fact that everything belongs to God, and that we stand as sinners before him. Without the shedding of blood, as we read in the book of Hebrews, there is no forgiveness of sins. There's no presence with God. There's no friendship with God. There's no covenant with God without sacrifice. And so the priests were the mediators that were supposed to facilitate this sacrificial system. They were to go up to the altar they were to burn incense before the Lord, a pleasing aroma. God sees worship. He calls it his incense. And so, yes, they had literal incense they burned in the Old Testament times, but that was a sign of what worship was supposed to be. The priests were the worship leaders for the people of God. And thirdly, he says, they were to wear the ephod before me. Now, we're, we hear about Samuel wearing a linen ephod. This was probably some kind of an apron. It's just a, it's a sign. The linen ephod is a sign of a priest in training. It's kind of like your, you know, before you get your bars or your stripes or anything, it's like your basic ephod. But the, the ephod that he's referring to here is what the high priest would wear. He would wear this garment, this intricate garment woven, interlaid with, with gold thread and jewels, precious jewels. And, and these jewels that he would wear, he would wear 12 stones that would represent the people of God. The high priest would go into the tabernacle. Remember now, the tabernacle is at Shiloh at this time. He would go into the tabernacle bearing the names of the people of God on his breast. He's their representative. He was their mediator. He was the guarantee to the people that their prayers would be heard, that their sins would be forgiven, that their sacrifices would be accepted. This is the job. This is the calling of the priest. And so it puts it in perspective for us just how far these men have fallen. Eli, we learn later, is serving as judge in Israel. He's of the priestly line. He's a descendant of Levi, and his sons are serving as priests in the tabernacle, and they are doing a poor job of it. God describes what they're doing as contempt. They have contempt for the Lord's sacrifice. They have contempt for the offering of the Lord. He actually describes them as worthless men 
which is a good translation, but just to kind of clarify here, this is the same word we saw for Hannah. Remember when Hannah, Eli thought that she was drunk and said, she said, don't think me a worthless woman. This word for worthless is Belial. And the word doesn't just mean not very valuable. It means destructive. It means that these men were destroying the worship of God. They were treating the offering with contempt. Now we also hear that they were sleeping with women at the entrance of the tent of meeting. This isn't something unique to their time. We see how many great ministries, how many amazing evangelists fallen to sexual sin, even today. And yet, as horrific as that is, and we'll come back to that, as horrific as that is, the main grievance God has against these men is the fact that they are actually taking what belongs to the Lord and plundering it for themselves. We saw this in the book of Ezekiel, if you can remember, when God was speaking against Israel's shepherds and saying, you're fattening yourselves on the flock you're supposed to protect for me. And you can almost hear the, the cries of the people. They're saying, well, 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 hold on a second. You can take what you want, but let me offer my sacrifice to God first, and the priests won't have it. They say, no, me first. I want my due, and then God can have whatever is left to him. It's not a coincidence that when God put up the, the idea of a tithe, again, an Old Testament idea, not that you, to be a good Christian, you have to give exactly 10% of everything you have, but not that it's a bad rule. But when he instituted the tithe in Old Testament Israel, it was the first fruits. It was the first fruits. It was before taxes. It was the, the very first gleanings. It was a confidence that this had come from God and to God it returns. And yet, Hophni and Phinehas are taking it for themselves. That's the reality of their failure, and it has a threefold result. The first instance, God is despised. He tells us that in verse 30. He says that those who honor me, I shall honor, but those who despise me. Now think, do you think Hophni and Phinehas were going around, waking up in the morning thinking, how can I despise the Lord today? No, that's, that's not quite the attitude they would have had. No, they saw themselves as priests. Hey, we got a pretty good job. It's got great benefits. Nobody really seems to care that we can kind of just live how we want and offer up these sacrifices, and it's all good with God. He hasn't really done anything. He hasn't, he hasn't really had any sort of grievance against us. We're fine. We're good. But they were despising God. People even who acknowledge God but, but just kind of want to live their own lives, they're like, I don't despise him. He's fine. God's, to, to, to take the, the poem from Robert Browning way out of context, God's in his heaven, all is right in the world. I'm down here, and I want to live as I want. But to live as you want, apart from God, is to despise him. To take God's worship and to use it for your own enjoyment and your own gain. Not that we shouldn't enjoy worship. God calls us to delight, to rejoice in him. But to take the things of God and to use them for ourselves, to set our minds on the things of men and not the things of God, is to despise him. And that's the chief thing. That's the chief result. That's the chief reason why God is bringing judgment on the house of Eli. Not only is God despised, but God's worship is devalued. I wonder sometimes if, if, uh, if we realize what the point of salvation is. What the point of church is, really. I mean, church, you could say, what's, why does a church exist? Why do we as Delta Oaks exist? And you could talk about a number of things. You could approach it from a number of angles. We want to reach the lost. We want to build up the saints. We want to preach the gospel. But what are we called to do? What is God calling us to do at the end of time in the new heavens and the new earth? What has God always been calling us to do? It's to worship him. That's our chief end. God is seeking a people to worship him, to glorify him, and the people of Israel, for all the crazy stuff that's going on in Israel at this time, there are people in Israel who are just trying to come to Shiloh, people like Elkanah, just coming to Shiloh, just want to worship the Lord, and they're hindered. Their worship is devalued, debased. 
it's taken, they're, ta- they're not following God's rules for worship, they're following man's rules for worship. The priests are following man's rules for worship, and it's hindering the people's worship of God. This is a great sorrow. I wonder if we think this is a real great sorrow in, in, in our lives. I, I know things have, have really changed since COVID, and there's a lot of challenges we face now that, that weren't maybe quite in the forefront in the days before. But how many people spurn worship because they think, well, all I need is my Bible, right? I just have the Bible here. I, I'm just here. I can, I can just do my Christian life by myself. And yes, we are called to private worship, but God is calling us to corporate worship as well. In fact, chiefly, he calls us one day out of the week to come and gather and worship him. And yet, often because our leaders don't seem to very, care very much about worship, that worship is devalued. Again, we'll go back to our qualification here. I'm not trying to say that everything is so terrible. There are thousands upon thousands of churches, leaders, saints, people and congregations, brothers and sisters in Christ, worshiping with us this morning. Worshiping with us this morning. We want to celebrate that. But at the same time, we want to ask, when we come to worship, are we coming recognizing that this is the most important thing that we will ever do? In fact, this is the eternal thing that we will do. When all the football games are over, we will be worshiping our Lord in heaven. But Hophni and Phineas weren't thinking along the eternal plane. They were thinking along a temporal plane and what they could get here and now, and they devalued the worship. But there's a third result, and that is that not only is the worship devalued, not only is God despised, but that lives are destroyed. Lives are destroyed. Think about this for a second. We have these women here at the tent serving, probably preparing, probably cleaning, probably doing the things that we would you know, ask. You, know, you see people taking the trash out here at church, doing those kinds of things, putting out the coffee. And here you have these powerful priests coming in. And they're sleeping with them. They're feeding on the flock treating them like pieces of meat, like the pieces of meat in the cauldron. They're plundering them. Now, I'm not, not to say that these women might not have, some of these women might not have had their own sins to reckon with, but the, the view here is on the leaders, on the priests. They're treating people as a means to an end, and they're wrecking lives because of it. Our sins are not our own. They don't just affect our own. They affect all around us. We don't recognize that. When we we sin, we say, this is just between me and God. Well, it's not just between you and God. Your sins, even your private sins, the sins of your heart, have ramifications for those around you. And the sins of spiritual leaders, how much more so? The voices you are supposed to trust, the very voice of God, preaching, right preaching. This is a, uh, we talk about this perhaps in the, in the inquirer's class. When a preacher preaches rightly, he preaches the very words of God. And from the very mouth that's supposed to be preaching peace and restoration and forgiveness of sins, they are being led astray. Their lives are wrecked. But it's not only the lives of these women, it's not only the lives of those who are led astray by the priests that are wrecked. Notice, They've wrecked their own lives as well. Paul talks about this in the New Testament. He talks about two gentlemen, Hymenaeus and Philetus, who are making, leading people astray and making a shipwreck of their faith. They're ruining their lives and they don't even know it. You want to ask, Hophni, Phineas, was it worth it? Was it worth it to sleep with those women? Was it worth it to take that extra piece of meat? Was it worth it to take the fat and the choicest parts of the sacrifice? Was it really worth it to do all of that? Was it worth it to take that money from the church? Was it worth it to have that affair? Was it worth it? In all of these instances, we need to ask that of ourselves as well as Christians. Whenever we face temptation, is this worth it? Because the devil loves to present the bait and hide the hook. As Thomas Brooks once said, he loves to put forward the choicest parts of the meat and forget to mention conveniently that there is judgment and wrath stored up for those who will despise the Lord. Their lives are wrecked, destroyed. This will come to pass very vividly for Eli. God says there's going to be a sign. Both Hophni and Phinehas are going to die in one day. We're going to read about that, Lord willing, in in a passage coming soon. 
But more than that, we'll find later in the book of 1 Samuel that it's not just Hophni and Phinehas that will suffer. In fact, the whole house will suffer for this. Again, our sins have ramifications for those whom we love and care for. The whole house of Eli will be slaughtered in an instant. Say, for one man, Abiathar, he will go and join David and be a priest for a time, and then he himself will turn away from the Lord, and he will be deposed. And that's it for the house of Eli. They will no longer serve as faithful priests. Can I just make a practical point here? I think we have intuitive, especially as evangelicals, we have this this intuitive sense of we want to forgive sinners, and we should. God has, as we have been forgiven, we should forgive. Forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. We should forgive, but forgiveness does not equate forgetting. It does not mean that there are not consequences of sin. And it's so frustrating when you look out and you see spiritual leaders fall and then repent, supposedly, and then they're just right back up on their platform. No, in fact, God says that these men need to be above reproach. So it doesn't mean that there's not forgiveness for those who fall. But are we wise to thrust them right back? Or do we not recognize that this is a holy calling? This is a weighty calling. And when we thrust thieves and adulterers back into the limelight under pulpits, it, it devalues the worship. It leads people astray. But in any event, There are consequences for Eli's house. They will be cut off. Their lives will be destroyed. There will be a wreck. Great will be the falling of Eli's house. God takes sin seriously. Those who despise him, I don't really like that translation, lightly esteem. It's accurate, it's true, but more than that, That word, it's more than that. It's not just he's going to lightly esteem. What does it mean for God to lightly esteem you? It doesn't mean, ah, I don't really think that much of him. No, for God to lightly esteem, that's Bible talk for he's going to curse you. He's going to cut you off. He is going to despise you. Those who despise me, I will despise, God says. Those, it's the same thing as Jesus says when he returns And those who despised him, those who would not confess him, he will say, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I I don't know you. I don't esteem you. We're so concerned about self-esteem or the esteem of others. We want people to have good opinions of us. What about God's opinion of us? And it's at that moment where we should all get a little nervous because it's great to look at this passage and say, look how terrible those leaders were. But do we realize when it says, those who honor me, I will honor, we begin to realize, do we begin to realize that none of us have truly honored him as we ought? None of us have offered these pure sacrifices. None of us have selflessly gone to the Lord in worship. None of us have fully and faithfully kept his law. Those who honor me, I will honor. Who gets to fall into that category? If it were up to me and myself, it wouldn't be me. It wouldn't be me, it wouldn't be Elkanah, it wouldn't even be Samuel. Those who honor me, I will honor. It's a heavy thing to think of, but as we turn now to the, to the grace in this passage, we see there truly is a grace for us in the midst of all the wreckage that Hophni and Phinehas have left. In the midst of all of this false worship, there is grace in the wreck, even for those who would not honor God as they ought. The first place I would suggest that we see this is in the blessing of Eli. Now, Eli is a character I'm not really sure how to feel about. He, he's not, a, as, as one friend once said to me, in the Old West you have black hat guys and white hat guys, bad guys and good guys. He's kind of a gray hat guy. It does seem like Eli's trying to do the right thing, but he's not very competent. Or perhaps he's afraid. Perhaps he lacks courage or conviction. In any event, we see this man who is certainly not a great example. No one wants to stand up and say, you know, dare to be an Eli, right? But at the same time, we find Eli, what is he doing in verse 20? He's blessing Hannah and Elkanah. 
He's blessing them, and he says, may the Lord bless you. And this is an important principle. Please take this to heart. Your grace, the grace that God gives you, is not dependent upon the strength or the quality or the qualification of the minister. Say that again. The grace that God gives you is not dependent upon the quality or the qualification or the strength or the holiness of the minister who ministers to you. It was actually an early church controversy when there were uh, persecutions. We won't get into all of that. We could be here all day talking about stuff like that. But when there were persecutions and ministers were falling away and they were denying Christ and then people were sitting around wondering, well, that guy baptized me. Is my baptism valid? That guy preached to me. I heard Christ from him. I was discipled by him. Am I still a Christian? As we see, as God is screaming to us here in 1 Samuel chapter 2, the answer is yes. God's strength is greater than the weakness of his ministers. And so please take that to heart. Anytime you see spiritual leaders fall, don't lose faith in the God who sustains you. They have a new category, a new type of person. People my age and younger especially, they call them ex-evangelicals who are disgusted by spiritual leadership and the, falling, the failings in, in the church. And while I understand their frustration, if they had even read the Bible for a moment, they would know that that is no reason to mistrust. I dare not distrust my God even when saints fall. My salvation is not dependent upon that guy up there who spoke pretty good at a worship conference. My salvation is dependent upon the Jesus Christ who spoke peace to me, to those who were far off and to those who were near. And it's that amazing grace that we see even in Eli's blessing as he blesses Hannah and Elkanah. It's God who's doing the blessing. Eli could be a great guy, he could be a terrible guy, he could be a great father, he could be a terrible father, but God's blessing is sure. But there's more grace in store here. Notice you see there for Hannah that she conceives and bears three sons and two daughters. Again, this just as we saw with Hannah before, this is not saying if you pray hard enough, suddenly you're going to get all the things in this world that you wanted. But it is saying that God deals bountifully with those who pray. And he blesses them. And so Hannah demonstrates for us. By the way, this is the last time we ever hear Hannah. I think in the whole Bible. We meet a girl named Anna. We actually met her not too long ago in the New Testament. But Hannah is gone from the stage at this point. And what's the last thing she leaves us with? God's grace. That's what Hannah means, grace. And God's grace left to her. And the boy Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. That's the second grace in the wreck that we find. Again, I asked you to to keep track of how many times Samuel is mentioned here. That wasn't just a game to keep you entertained. That was actually to show you how the author of 1 Samuel is weaving in, just like in the priest's ephod, how it was, it was interwoven in the warp and the woof. There were these threads of gold. Well, in this tarnished thread of the wreck of Hophni and Phinehas and the priesthood of the Levites, we have this little silver thread of Samuel. And the boy Samuel grew. And the boy Samuel, and the boy Samuel, and the boy, now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. Luke is going to take that exact language and use it to describe Jesus. This boy Samuel, though Hannah perhaps didn't know it all, we know from her song that she understood at least a piece of it, this boy Samuel is going to be used for the redemption of Israel. This boy Samuel is a glimmer of hope in the darkness. This boy Samuel, even though all of the priests seem to be conspiring against the Lord and despising him, we see that Samuel at least is someone that people say, maybe there's hope there. Maybe there's hope there. Maybe the Lord has not abandoned us. And in fact, God says as much in the third grace that we find in our passage. God is a God of severe judgment, but he's also a God of severe judgment mercy. See, do you notice he can't help himself? Even as he's so angry at Eli and so angry at Eli's feelings for not keeping his sons in check, for not defending the honor of his name, and he meets out this judgment against Eli, he says to him, verse 35, I have a plan for a priest. 
and I will build him a sure house. I'm going to have a priest who will do everything that I have in my heart and in my mind, and he's going to go in and go out. He's going to perform worship for my, before my anointed forever. He will do this. Forever he will do this. And what's he referring to here? Well, in the first instance, he's referring to when the house of Eli does finally fall, and eventually years later when Abiathar, the last of Eli's house, is deposed, God raises up the house of Zadok. Zadok the priest, the family of Zadok, would serve as priests before the Lord all the days following the fall of the house of Eli and all throughout Israel's history. These priests would serve in the temple, in Solomon's temple. But of course, it wouldn't be doing justice to the text to just think it was the priests of Zadok because God says they're going to go in and out before my anointed forever. This priest is going to go before my anointed forever. So is this hyperbole? Is this God just trying to make a point here? No, in fact, this is a promise of what we found in Hebrews chapter 9. Because it wasn't the priests of Zadok. They could have gone in year after year after year, but what does the author of Hebrews say? It would have never been enough. Not all the blood of bulls and goats. We sing that hymn once in a while, right? Not all the blood of beasts can atone for my sin. Because priests died. And animal atonement can't cover up human failing and rebellion against God. But God has a priest in mind. The book of Samuel is about how God is raising up his anointed one. His king David, his prophet Samuel, his priest. But in fact, it's all pointing to the fact that Jesus is coming to be our great high priest. He's coming to atone for sin. He's coming to offer up right sacrifices, and he offers all of it. All of it. He gives. For the forgiveness of sins, he sacrifices himself. He enters into the holy place, not made with hands, not the tabernacle, not the temple. He enters into heaven itself and pleads for the sinners who are now saints. He pleads for their name. He enters with the names written on his hands, he says in Isaiah 47. Sorry, 49. Isaiah 49, I have them written on my hands. I enter into the presence of the Lord with their names and I plead for them. I pray for them. I've sacrificed myself for them, and my sacrifice is sufficient for them. We have a faithful high priest who has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. And the practical point that the author of Hebrews makes is, then let us boldly approach the eternal throne. Let us enter with confidence. Not because our pastors were great, or our elders were great, or that guy we listened to on a podcast somewhere was great, but because our Jesus is great. And that he is able to save me from my sin. Those who honor God, God will honor. Those who trust in Jesus find that they have credited to them the complete, perfect, righteous honor. Jesus never failed to honor his father. But in Jesus Christ, I proclaim and announce this morning that you, if you trust in him, have that honor credited to you. You are his righteousness. And so he calls you to honor. Though we stumble at many points, we have an advocate. We have a great and faithful high priest who is our mediator. If someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? Well, as it turns out, it's the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ. The story of Eric Little continues, if you know it. He does win that race. The nation of Britain praises him and everything sounds great, but... What does Eric do? He actually goes on to be a missionary. And he will die in an internment camp serving the saints in Asia, in China. It's not a very honorable death from worldly standards. It was filthy. It was disgusting. In fact, I think it was only, it was not long before the end of the world he died. It sounds so pointless. He could have gone on to do so much. Imagine the book tours he could have done. Imagine all the, the great encouraging words he could have shared. And yet he honored his Lord. He honored his Lord, and he is now today honored by him. 
The sons of Eli were worthless men. They were destructive men. But in Jesus Christ, we truly find our worth. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. You are our advocate, our friend, and our faithful high priest. That where we fall so short, you ever live to intercede for us. As not just a sign, but the reality of our Father's love for us. We ask that you would give us eyes to see and hearts to understand what you've laid up for us in this word. That we may honor and serve you. And our Heavenly Father in heaven and the Holy Spirit with whom you reign exalted. We ask this. Hear our prayer we ask. Amen.